as we move. Welcome to this webinar uh, today. My name is Blessing Mawire, and I'll be chairing our webinar um, for this afternoon for my time, right? And for uh, with all in different time zones. I'm an information and knowledge management specialist based in uh, Pretoria in South Africa. With me today also is my colleague, Caroline De Bruyne, who is a knowledge and evidence specialist at Public Health England in the UK. And she's uh, also co-hosting and providing us with as much technical support as possible. Our focus today will be on librarians are essential advocating for a seat at the table. This webinar is being coordinated and hosted by the Evidence for Global and Disaster Health Special Interest Group under IFLA. Under IFLA. And um, its main purpose really is to provide coordination, advocacy, leadership for cross sectional knowledge and library services in support of the Evidence for Global and Disaster Health agenda. The SIG brings together partners and stakeholders within and outside the library profession. So we're really excited to be running um, a series of webinars. So this is one uh, in a number of webinars that we've hosted um, and coordinated so far. Today, we're going to have uh, two presenters with us and I'm going to um, read us just a summary of their biographies. The first one is uh, Siobhan champ Blackwell and she's located at the National Library of Medicine Public Services Division. She's responsible for managing the Disaster and Information Specialist Training Program and coordinates with the Medical Library Association to maintain the MLA Disaster Information Specialization Certificate. In addition, she's the content editor for the Disaster Literature, uh, Literature Database for Disaster Medicine and Public Health and manages digital communication tools for the Disaster Information Management Research Center. So welcome to Siobhan. We also have with us uh, Lenny Ryan, who is the coordinator of the e-library training initiative. Uh, this uh, Librarians Without Borders Medical Library Association project has been funded by the Elsevier Foundation since 2007. The project's principal activities are conducting workshops and the developing and updating of training material for Hinari and Research for Life. We'll hear more about these programs uh, from Lenny's presentation. Um, we, since 2007, Lenny has conducted more than 70 Hinari and Research for Life workshops in 41 countries and developed or updated more than 20 training modules for the various programs. Lenny also coordinates the Librarian Without Borders Elsevier Fund, uh, Foundation Research for Life Grant Awards. And since 2015, 2016, sorry, uh, 15 proposals have been funded and this has a value of between four to 6,000 US dollars. The projects range from research for life workshops to the development of videos and courses, including development, developing systematic reviews in resource poor environments. So thank you very much for joining us, Lenny, and a big welcome. Um, Siobhan will be presenting uh, on ways librarians can advocate for themselves by initiating and developing relationships with relevant local, state, and federal officials and agencies, as well as with emergency responders. And our second presenter, Lenny, will be presenting on his experience with the Research for Life Advocacy Toolkit and its application in different scenarios. Um, at this point, um, I would like to now hand over to our first presenter, Siobhan. So I'm going to just stop sharing my screen and hand over to you, Siobhan. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, let's see, I want to uh, start my video. Okay, thank you, Blessing and um, Caroline and everyone um, from the IFLA Special Interest Group. I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, I, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I work at the National Library of Medicine um, in the Public Services Division. And um, at the National Library of Medicine, we do have a center, the Disaster Information Management Research Center, that focuses on providing resources for the professional workforce um, and hope that we can work with librarians to share the, the resources that we've developed um, 
uh, through this center. The library has also uh, resources for the general public. Um, <clears throat> there's professional journal literature. There's a vast array of resources. So <clears throat> one of the things that, um, that we've talked about is how do we help librarians and others to find this information and, and, and use it because um, <clears throat> we all know that, li that disasters are local. And so in fact, in the library, we have this vision of kind of this network of people across the globe who have um, an understanding of how to find and use the information around health um, to, to be able to assist the, the first responders in their community, the first receivers, and the general public in being prepared in terms of the health impacts of disasters. So we have um, uh, a, what we call the Disaster Information Specialist resource. And one of the things in that resource, when we talk about having a seat at the table, um, there are librarians at the table already, and, and we have this bibliography um, that we keep, um, which, of course, it's, it, it's, not, um, it's not every article that's been published, because there's too many, but these are articles about librarians that have actually been working in um, disaster response and some of the work that they they have done in that and it, it is US centric um, because this is the National Library of Medicine which focuses on um, work with the um, in the United States we we do have um, a project let's see if I can find it now um, that's called Landi it's the Latin American project that we um, work with and of course I'm not going to be able to find it this morning but I will while Lenny's speaking I'll find the link to it and put it in the um, chat box but we do have a big outreach effort in Latin America um, with a bit helping build a network of librarians um, in in that area so that they also have access to these resources but in the language uh, of their countries so one of the things under the specialization is this training. We've worked with the U.S. Medical Library Association who offers um, what they call a disaster information specialization. And so we've created um, and worked with uh, subject matter experts to create these courses that if you, they're all available online. And if you take these courses, you can apply to the Medical Library Association um, to get a, a specialization certificate. Now you can take the courses just in general, just take them on your own and you don't have to um, apply for that specialization. All of the courses are free. They're all available online. And in fact, what I'm gonna do for um, my part of the class is take a look at this course that we call a seat at the table. So um, you can see it in the list right here. And if I just already have the class open. Um, I, I hope that if you have questions, you will put them in the chat box. Let me see if I can get the chat box open on my end. Um, I thought that I, was, I had it open so I could see it. Carolyn, um, please, just if you see questions show up in the chat box, ask them of me because I cannot see it right now. Yes, um, I do want this to be interactive. Okay. So, um, so the I'm I'm gonna kind of um, go to a different section. I'm gonna start on the section in this, but there's you can see there's a lot of um, this is how the courses are set up. Where you come to this very easy, just click on the link in the in the training page and you come to this class and you're right there in the class. We ask that you take a pre and post test so that we um, can make the class better. Um, so if I hit the next section, it brings up the, it brings up the pre course evaluation, which I'm going to skip. I'm going to actually go to section four, which is the practical steps. And this is what I want to go over uh, for the portion of this course. 
um, <clears throat> the the practical steps um, I think are a really valuable piece of this class. So so you can do the same thing that I did if you want to find the resources. And again, I'll put this link in the chat box um, when I'm done, so that so that you can get to this section if there are things in here that you are really interested um, in in finding. So the first thing that we have is this idea that um, if you are wanting to have a seat at the table, the first thing that you want to know is who's at the table already or um, who should be at the table. And we know uh, in the United States that many public librarians are already, um, just because of the fact that they are a public library and they're, they are part of their city um, municipality already, that many of them have seats at the table, but haven't been advocating in terms of disasters as a part of the work that they can do. And some of them have. So we, we know that there's this continuum of, um, of what people are already doing and what librarians are already doing. And we want to help you to see maybe things that you have have missed, or if you're starting from scratch, here's some ideas of how you can um, work on it. One of the things that I like about um, this particular class is that we have um, uh, links to Word documents, which now if you're, um, if you are in a country other than the U.S., you can go in and you know, just edit this at, at will instead of who's, who's uh, you know, you don't have senators, you have different um, govern, governmental positions that you would want to fill in here. And so the first thing to do is to just start to build this contact list of who are the people that you should be working with and what are ways that you can um, connect with them and contact them. Um, we know that um, uh, in New Jersey, we had this uh, Hurricane Sandy that came through. I don't remember what year that happened. And the, um, the state of New Jersey was very devastated by that hurricane. And the librarians, the public librarians were, were so proactive in the work that they did during that hurricane. Um, that they were already at the table, many of them, and they, but they hadn't, again, they hadn't gotten this health piece in. And so after that, after that event happened, they had these lists of contacts, but then we were able to work with them and help them get some more information out there um, to the, to the people that they needed to contact. So I really like this idea of starting out with making your contact list of key leaders and um, who are you missing already? If you're in um, uh, an academic setting, there's, um, there is, in that setting, there is somebody who's responsible for if an event happens on your campus. Who are they? Find out uh, their name and go ahead and have a talk with them and remind them that the library is a place that people come to for information and, and shelter so um, that they can find ways to use you. So it doesn't matter what kind of library you're at. If you're in a hospital library, it's the same thing. Find out who in your institution is responsible for the emergency um, outreach, uh, the emergency management, I'm sorry, in um, your institution, your hospital, uh, wherever you are. Now, depending on um, how you're comfortable with communication, one of the things you can start to do when you have that list, you can do an informal reaching out, or there's a there's an idea of a letter of introduction. Um, I'm not going to open the Word document. You can see here um, where we have the letter of introduction in this block where it just gives you some ideas of here's a nice intro for you and a way to customize the letter, what kinds of ideas you might want to include um, in the letter that you would write. 
um, you know, we we don't enough use this basic form of of um, communication. We we're, we're all so um, busy with the the technology, but isn't it interesting to get to do an actual letter you might mail, or you can you can change it to become an email that you would send out to somebody. So a letter of introduction or an email of introduction to just say, hey, I'm here. I actually have things that you might be interested in, and I'd really like to talk with you about it. It's important to then do the follow-up phone call. Um, you might, depending again on the person, you might end up having to go through an administrative assistant. Um, here's some examples of how you could work with that administrative assistant to talk with the person, or you might get directly through and just say, listen, I sent you this letter, I want to follow up on it. And they might have tossed the letter, they might not, um, they, they might have read it and put it aside, but having that follow-up phone call will bring it to mind um, the fact that they got it. And um, we're all busy and people in emergency management are busy as well and they might have been intrigued by it, but they're not going to do the follow-up with you. It is incumbent upon you once you've reached out um, either by email or letter to then do the follow-up with the, with the phone call. We all should also have our elevator speech, and this is a, such a hard thing to put together. Um, I love this. I help emergency responders in my town, institution, whatever, gain access to reliable, current, and verified information to support them in their decision making. I I just think we all need to write this one down, and um, and have that. I wish I had this memorized because when people ask me what I do, I want, you know, I'm like, oh, it's just so complicated, blah, 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 blah. And, oh, here's something that I do. This is what I do. This is what at the Disaster Information Management Research Center, this is our basic mission, helping people find access to reliable information for their decision making. And I think that that last sentence, that last part of the sentence is the crucial piece. Um, we all know that decisions made during disasters are made based on just on the information that people have. That's why we're all at this meeting. That's why we're part of the IFLA special interest group is because we understand the fact that decisions are made based on information and that we want that information to be evidence-based. And as librarians, we support people with that mission in mind. And here's a very simple statement that sums up what we do. Um, and um, in, in the red bullets where it says number five practice, that's something that I know I need to do. As I've said, I, when someone asks me what I do, I just get all kind of, I don't know what I do. I do so many things, but this is what I do, and I should just practice this myself. So um, this, this idea of kind of having a strategic plan, this is an, this is an example of a, strate of a strategy. It may not be the perfect strategy for you, but the idea of putting together um, in one nice little package a way of, of finding out who it is that you want to contact, what it is that you want to say, and how it is that you're going to reach out to those people is just a really nice um, um, idea of, of getting yourself prepared. and. Um, you can just come to this website and find all of these really nice resources, excuse me, and, um, and pull that together. So, Carolyn, were there questions that came up while I was going through this? <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and, Carolyn, you're probably muted. They aren't that I've noticed this blessing, uh, Siobhan. They're I'm sorry? 
There are mostly comments, but um, there's one that just came up now from Anne Martin. Okay. Um, she says, hi, or oh, is it part of the role to persuade publishers and researchers to make relevant research studies and data openly available to develop policy to ensure this happens? Oh, that's a great one. So, of course, um, we find that to be uh, something really important ourselves. And, um, well, there's a couple of things. Um, that let's see. So, so when an event happens, um, a lot of times the publishers will make their resources available. And um, so we have on. So, for example, during Ebola, we do some research to find out which publishers um, have made their resources freely available. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, for this event, uh, we haven't find, found that so many of them have. Um, the last time the Ebola event happened, this list of free resources was huge. Um, the library works. Um, we have what we call the Emergency Access Initiative. And um, Um, this is when the library does work with publishers and say during this event, you know, how can, how can you help us to um, share the resources and the information freely? And we activate what we call the Emergency Access Initiative. And what that does is people who are within certain, who are in the area can come into this website. If it's active, um, this will be the information on how to log in will be here and you can log in to PubMed and download the journals um, from these publishers at no cost. So uh, it's not it's not the answer I know that you're looking for, right? We're all talking about how how can we have open access to journals in general because it's not just when an event, a big event happens and we want we little events happen well and they're not little to us right they're little in terms of the scope of the world but to us they're everything it's our whole world how do we help people find the information during those times and that um, that's a bigger question than what our small center can deal with but um, I know we're all trying to figure that one out um, were there other questions um, not at the moment, Siobhan. Okay. Um, I, I want to go back and just say, um, before we turn it over to Lenny, to just, to just say, to um, go into this um, resource on the training and um, take a look at the courses. Uh, there is a course on um, for international um, understanding the international context of, of disasters, the, the Suburni uh, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive resources. Many of these resources are um, ones that are not U.S. specific. There are a few that are the U.S. response to disasters and public health emergencies. So take a look at the list um, and, and please go in and take some of these courses. And I hope that they're something that you would be, um, that you would gain information from and that would help you in the work that you're doing. Great. So um, I'm stop sharing now or unless there's other questions. Um, it's actually a comment uh, that I've noted from Caroline and um, from Neil that there is a discussion taking place on the healthcare information for all forum HIFA uh, right now about open access. So, and uh, the links have been provided in the chat panel for those who are interested. Thank you for that contribution. Oh, yes. Thank you, Neil. And I forgot about that. I'm on that, um, I'm part of um, the health information for all. And I'd forgotten that that conversation is going on right now. So thank you for, for reminding me of that. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm going to put my camera on on hide again and um, turn it over to Lenny. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Siobhan. 
We will now have our second uh, presenter, Lenny Ryan. And just as a reminder, is Lenny presentation. Uh, Lenny is presenting on his experience um, with Research for Life, uh, with the advocate content, and its application in different scenarios. I hand over to you now, uh, Lenny. Hello, everyone. I think I've done this correctly and confirmed that you can hear me. Now I just have to figure out how to go down my slides. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so what were we talking uh, Initially, when Blessing contacted me, I wasn't sure how this fits in, but now that I've heard the first presentation, I understand that giving some tools that may be adapted would be very useful to doing this kind of advocacy work. So very briefly, the background is that I have a small grant and work on training for Research for Life and write training material. And this has been going on for 13 years, thanks to the Elsevier Foundation, and it keeps me from being retired. Okay, so there is a need for these advocacy toolkits for multiple reasons. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Then we also realized that this narrow toolkit we wrote would be broader could be used by others within Research for Life, and now we're potentially expanding beyond that. I'm gonna talk about a marketing plan exercise, but the last thing I want to say from my experiences, and others can agree if they want, there's a commonality of library issues. This whole thing of needing advocacy, of needing to be assertive, of needing to get out of the library, of needing to, to network with other groups happens everywhere. I hear the same kinds of questions and issues, in say a workshop 10 days ago in Zambia that I used to hear from my colleagues at the University of Florida. So these kinds of situations are, occur all the time. I think the big difference is the amount of resources a library has to be able to do an advocacy plan and do marketing and things like that. So let me go on and if anyone wants to add a chat about that, please do, although I can't quite see them now. So uh, the title of this toolkit is Adv Advocacy for Change, Research for Life, Advocacy Toolkit for Librarians. And we had a team from both the uh, Research for Life Communications and Capacity Ve Development Groups. It's completed in October 2018. It's available to all research for life institutions all geared toward advocacy work in Group B institutions. Group B institutions are ones that are required to pay $1,500 a year to access Research for Life. Do I need to do a little background about Research for Life or not? Just that it is a partnership between uh, UN agencies and multiple publishers and grants access to uh, information in agriculture, environment, health, development, and now legal information. Uh, it is a voluntary partnership where publishers can pick and choose which countries to make the material available in. We also, of course, include journals that are included in the directory of open access journals. As my attitude is, it doesn't matter where you get the information as long as you can get it. So far, I think we've, uh, oh, 100 copies of this toolkit have been downloaded. And there it is, Attribution 4.0 International, which means that any one of you can download it, adapt it, use it, change it, alter it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Am I going too fast or am I okay? I get no feedback. Okay. So here are two quotes, one from school librarians and one from the Canadian Association of Public Libraries. And both of them use the term ongoing process in understanding how to build over an extended period of time. So I think that's one thing we have to understand about advocacy. It doesn't stop. Promotion, marketing doesn't stop when you're in your institution. Okay, types of advocacy. Uh, just a little brief summary of types of advocacy, and I think this was previously mentioned a bit. Gathering data about your library, conducting surveys, professional development, associations, task forces like this uh, interest group, communicating with decision makers. That clearly was discussed in the previous one. And more in the academic setting, attending faculty or staff meetings, but if you're in a public library situation, that would be attending 
meetings of the commission in your town, uh, attending conferences, making presentations, collaborating, network. So these are all types of advocacy. So in this toolkit, there are like six boxes that look just like this, where individuals, after reading the text, which I just summarized, would put in, can you identify and list other types of advocacy efforts? So then you look at the list and say, oh, I can also do this or that, and you jot that down. So this is a toolkit that people can develop uh, as they go along. Okay, second question is, what can your library offer? In this case, we're talking about e-library resources available, available through Research for Life. So your list would be available disaster uh, type resources and, where, and what benefit each one would have. So it's pretty easy, I think, to adapt this. So step one of this toolkit is to ask yourself questions that will help you in the best way identify problems and opportunities. So activity three then becomes, can you describe the problem you're trying to solve in a clear statement? Okay. Step two, what are the main goals you aim to achieve? What are the long-term and short-term objectives that build toward your goal? It took me many years to remember what a goal is and what an objective is. Step three, again, I, I identify and analyze your target audience. Goals and objectives should build on the understanding of your audience. So this idea of uh, user groups comes up time and time again. You need to identify your advocacy target audience, list your target audiences, and I think that's the fourth activity. You jot down on this piece of paper in this toolkit, different types of audiences you're trying to reach and provide a brief descriptions. I'm pretty much all, most of the participants the workshops I do are in academic institutions or ministry institutions or research institutions. So it's pretty easy to define the different user groups. You might have different ones in your environment. Next thing, list the resources your library has and the ones you can develop yourself to help advocacy strategy. I see some uh, chats are coming up. Should I look at them the next time they come up? So um, step five, yes, do we wanna stop here and look at, and talk about them? Uh, not for now, there's no uh, question. It's uh, mostly comments. Comments. I'll, yeah, I'll summarize. Okay, we can get to that at the end, as long as I'm not talking too fast. Okay, so, oh, I skipped developing a strategic plan and activities. Uh, these are just some examples. Organize library open events, invite administrators, conducting interviews, marketing your library, social media advocacy. I think there's another one that I, I should have put in. It's called I'm sure people have heard this, the teachable moment. When you're communicating with someone and they ask a question, you can say, well, we have all these resources available. Here's how you can access them. Here's how you use them. And usually if that's a key person, say it's a dean or a head of a research institute, if you can reach that person, you can really uh, get your message across. And I think that Siobhan was talking about this in her previous presentation. So write down a mix of tools and activities you wish to implement and organize them in a calendar. Step six, monitoring and evaluating. What did you do and did it work? This is always an ongoing part of any advocacy project. You monitor, evaluate, change, alternate, see what worked, see how you can improve for the next time. So this is just kind of ideas to what you need to go through after you've done uh, an advocacy type project. So where do we go now? Uh, in part of the Research for Life workshops, uh, the face-to-face -face workshops, we've developed a marketing plan presentation. And then there is a spreadsheet that is attached to that that I really tried to have groups do and work with each other. Uh, an example would be at the last workshop, we had all the librarians from nursing and midwifery institutions work together because they have a different mix of users than people from the academic institutions. So we really, really tried to organize it along that. We also had a group of three people from ministries. 
So the spreadsheet is completed manually, done in groups. And you'll see in a second, because it's a little complicated at the beginning, user groups are listed horizontally. But then you work down or vertically, and you note the information needs, the resources, how to promote, survey questions, distribution of survey questions, and evaluation of marketing plan. So you get to look at each group and see how this works and how it can be applied. So this is the, and it is kind of complicated to explain to the whole group, but once we get them going, you have your client groups at the top. And of course, since you're in different environments, you will have different client groups that are here. So A, B, C, D, E, F. So you may have, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think, and maybe Savan can help, what kind of groups you would have in disaster. You would have, uh, Elected officials, administrators, uh, emergency type people, and what kind of information does each group need? So then your information needs are listed and you just check off what types of information are needed. Or remember, this is really geared toward the academic world, but could easily be adapted. The third section, Research for Life and Internet Resources, you would have to edit this and change it to the types of resources that are available through, say, the uh, website that Siobhan was using and other tools like that. So you would have a different mix of list here, especially the bottom part, internet resources, grade literature, thesis databases. You would have a lot of useful internet resources there. So this would have to be tweaked or adapted to your environment. But it's easily easy to do because once you have this, this spreadsheet, you can make your changes. So we're now on the next page. And again, we list the client groups on top horizontally. And then we have a whole list of ideas how to promote the resources for each group. And you check off which resources would be useful. And again, we could have that letter that was discussed in the previous presentation as one of the re ways to promote the disaster management resources. And you would have the different groups and see what would work. Then we ask people to kind of come up with a, a brief questionnaire trying to highlight uh, the kinds of questions they would ask each group to see if they're aware of what is available, what is uh, accessible. Uh, the last part is how to distribute the survey questions. And again, you may have different groups than I have listed here, distributed by email, internet, library users, meetings, classes, other. Social media is listed in there. So you may have a different mix here. Again, this question of evaluating and marketing comes up at the end there, number of presentations, use of email, social media, increase uh, use of the resources, et cetera. So I'm gonna briefly show you a marketing strategy done by the nursing lecturers of the National University of Samoa and it's oh, five years old, almost four and a half years old. So they, students, lecturers, nurses, they talked about the information needs for each group. And then they talked about how to promote Hanari, which is the health related program within Research for Life. And you can see there are different ways of promoting it to nurse uh, students, lecturers, and nurse clinicians. So they've listed their groups horizontally and then vertically, they're talking about the information needs for each and how to promote it. Then there's a little bit about physical environment, limited space, capacity building, not enough computers, slow internet. That's just kind of an overview, a scan of their environment. And the last part is promotion tools, how they would deal with each group and promote the material the role of the unit staff, and then a little bit about how to evaluate the marketing plan. So they have very nicely in two, in one, two, three separate boxes listed the options that are there. And again, you could see how this applies what we discussed in the marketing plan. Okay, finally, oh, they have some survey questions, how to distribute it, and increasing usage of this research, feedback from staff and students, word of mouth. Okay, so this is just an example of 
what one group did with that spreadsheet, which is kind of a little complicated to do, but they did a very good job in the group. So where are our resources? They're all available on this page. The whole complete 17 page advocacy toolkit is there. The marketing strategy module is there, although I didn't discuss that. The marketing strategy exercise, that spreadsheet is there. There's my email. Uh, you're welcome to write to me if you have any problems or questions. And then there's also the Research for Life Health Desk, plus a reminder that everything is replicable, usable. Uh, there's no license restrictions with this Creative Commons license. So we want you to adapt it in a way that would work in your environment. I think that's it. Now we go to the chat, right? I see we're up to 21. Yes. And we'll continue our discussion that way. So I can close this, right? Yes, uh, thank yep. you very much, uh, Lenny. Um, we had a lot of uh, good comments coming through as you were presenting. Um, I think the, the comments that I made earlier when Siobhan was presenting was from Anne Bryce, where she was also talking about how finance even uh, introducing yourself or explaining what you do to your own family if you are trying out for an elevator pitch, for example. And we also had a, a comment from uh, Neil uh, as we were presenting, uh, talking about, you know, um, thinking more globally about the different platforms. So use of virtual communities um, and webinars to, to, to enhance uh, your platforms as you're doing your advocacy work. And uh, Anne Madden, who um, who's talking about developing um, filters for specific uh, topics and even sharing them. I think that's, uh, if and I imagine if I got you correctly, if not, you can just explain further. And we've also got um, different links to, to research for life, to the, to the train, to the toolkit, as well as uh, Siobhan's uh, email uh, contact as well. Okay, so in confirming that this is correct. So at this point, I want to open the floor if you've got any questions or comments for either Lenny or for Siobhan. Can I answer one of the Zoom questions from Anne about how do you think we can shift mindsets of partner stakeholders? Uh, that is such a difficult issue. And it's very complex. And at the last Research for Life meeting, we talked a lot about this and we're actually setting up a task force to look at how you reach management, how you get them involved, how you get them to understand the resources they have, and say, in the university setting, put it in the curriculum, have a gradable material on how to do a literature search, things like that. So it's, it's never an easy issue. We also struggle with it. Why aren't these institutions using the resources uh, how come you go somewhere and a third of the people at workshop say, oh, I can't find my password, uh, someone left with it, and things like that. It can be daunting, to say the least, even in my environment. If anyone wants to add any comments to that, please do, because it's a very complex issue, very difficult. Get those stakeholders to buy in. Of course, when I have a dean at a workshop, it's wonderful. So Lenny, this is Siobhan. Um, I, I think one of the things too to add to that, and we didn't go over it either, you or I in this um, session, is the information that we have, right? How do we, the way you change your mind is to say, uh, look at this is how you, it, this is how you can use it. Um, we found that one of the most important resources on our website is this page that we created that was just a list of um, apps that first responders could download onto their phone. And if you find that way to, that key entry way to get people interested and say, just with one small thing, this is something that can be useful for you, then they're more interested in other things that you might have. Um, it, it's just getting that mindset to say, oh, a library, how interesting. You have that? And people then become interested in what else you have. Yeah, it's hard okay. though. I can give you an example in the academic world. You say you have nursing students starting or medical students starting and you do an, uh, an orientation to the library and, and we tend to go on and on and on and speak at detail and kind of lose the people sometimes. 
The key there is when they're in their fourth year and they have a research project and you have to do a literature search, you work with the faculty and get back in there when it's really more important to them. So I don't know how that applies to disaster management. Maybe citing some examples of uh, tornadoes that go through or um, Florida hurricane season is starting and trying to get these people when they're starting to prepare and think about it. Does that make sense? I think that's, that's a great example. I'm a little out of my element <laughs> with disaster management, but I think a lot of these things uh, carry across. And that may be the original chat question. Great. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Lenny and also Siobhan. Um, I also have a comment from Anne Bryce, and I've just asked you to expound on how they're doing this in um, their leadership programs. And if you can unmute yourself, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you, Lenny and Siobhan. It's been really, I mean, one of the things that we keep stressing is that some of these, some of these tools and approaches are cross-sectoral. They can transfer. It's about us transferring our own knowledge, which is something that we need to do. Um, I think where, where we've, sometimes we've managed to make headway when we've a had some a real champion or somebody who's a a leader who absolutely gets the need to have us and just trying to harness them to help us write messages that speak to their peers and the thing that made most difference um, over the last 10 years is just pushing this this isn't just about giving people information, it's about saving lives, it's about doing more good than harm, it's about safety and quality. So finding the language that matters. So we go through all of the strategic plans that people have written and try and look at the words they've used and try and say, well, you know, this is about helping you do, you know, actually this isn't about helping you do this, this is about doing this for this organisation or group. It's, it's um, I think Blessing was a... a uh, session recently where I say it's not about supporting and serving people this is about um, making sure that the world's knowledge is used um, to them to the to help save lives um, so it's very difficult for the disaster setting because these things people these communities come and go very quickly they're not static so it's very difficult to plan who who you're going to need to influence so um, but I think the resources we've seen today from Siobhan and Lenny, fantastic templates, and we can make them, you know, contextually fit what we want to do. Um, and the more we can share all of these different examples, then, um, then we can harness everybody's experience as well. So thank you both very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, so I'm going to, uh, if there are no more questions in the chat, let me just check quickly. Uh, it's a comment from Lenny that he talks up, uh, about the developing countries have 10% of the research money, but published studies will impact on 90% of the world's population. Thank you for that uh, comment, Lenny. Um, at this point, if uh, there are no questions, I will round off our discussion. And um, just before we go, um, I would like to uh, give you a brief more about uh, what we are doing as uh, the SIG, the Evidence for Global and Disaster Health uh, SIG. So we've got uh, coming up uh, at the IFLA con Congress uh, in Athens in Greece, we've got three sessions before and during the actual Congress. And you can get more information about that in our current uh, newsletter as well. And we are in the process of uh, including webinars and working with the different um, stakeholders developing our uh, advocacy toolkit, which will hopefully pilot with one stakeholder group and we encourage you to follow the SIG if you have more interest about this. If you'd like to more, know more about uh, our SIG and the work that we're doing or a library advocacy, uh, we have questions after the webinar, please feel free to contact us via, via email. Uh, on the website uh, page on, on, if, on the IFLA website, or you can even follow us on Twitter. Uh, right now, we do have um, a Caroline who's been posting summaries of our webinar uh, on our Twitter page. So if you are uh, also on Twitter, please feel free uh, to pass along the message and uh, the, 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 the discussion today. 
But uh, at this point, I would really want to thank everyone for joining us for the webinar. And uh, a special thanks to our two presenters again, Yvonne and Lenny. Um, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you again at our next uh, webinars or at the evening in Athens. But uh, to everyone else, have a fabulous day. And uh, thank you again. We'll keep in touch. Thank you, everyone. And goodbye. Thank you, Blessing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Caroline, my cause.